Well, if I'm going to have to tell the story, then I'm going to have to start at the very beginning. My name is William Harp. I was born in Scotland. Now, I don't remember much about our homeland, but my pa said that times were hard then. We had no home to call our own and no soil to grow our own food. So my ma and pa took us two boys and we set out on a great journey across the ocean to a place where a man could have as much land as he wanted, a place they called America. We sailed across the sea for 74 days with barely enough food and water to make the journey before finally landed on the shores of North Carolina and settling in Orange County in 1774, just months before the American Revolution started. But I still remember how badly these Americans treated my family. You see, my pa was still loyal to the king and that didn't sit well with our new neighbors. And they frequently stole our farm animals, and they burned down our barn twice. One night, several men brutally attacked my ma and pa as they were walking home. They shot my pa, and then they pistol whipped him. They tied a rope around his neck, and they hung him from a tree. And then they raped my mother. Yeah, we were in America, but we hardly felt like Americans. I remember being filled with anger and rage, but there was nothing a small child could do about it. But deep inside me, I vowed that one day, my time would come. My parents had named my older brother, Makaja. Oh, he was tall and muscular. Me, I had flaming red hair, and I wasn't as tall, but my folks said that I got all the smarts of the family. I was very calculating, and I knew exactly how to get what I wanted. As we grew into our teens, most folks called my brother Big Harp, and they called me Little Harp. We were inseparable, always together. By 1775, the Revolutionary War was raging across the eastern seaboard. One night, as we were eating supper, we heard all kinds of racket coming from down the road. So I ran to the window to take a look. It was a loyalist gang that was burning down the homes of those who were fighting for the American patriots. My brother and I watched as they set fire to barns and houses. I knew this was something that I wanted to be a part of. So we grabbed the only weapons we had. Our rifle, our knife, and our tomahawk. And then we stole a neighbor's horse and we joined this group of renegades. And just like that, we were on our own, and we never saw our ma again. For the next six years, we experienced the thrill and the chaos of war. During the Battle of King's Mountain, I remember watching a musket ball lodging into a tree less than one inch from my brother's head. When we looked up, it was a man named Captain James Wood who had fired the shot. He got away, but I knew we'd see him again. We went on to fight the Battle of Blackstocks and Cowpens in January of 1781 and a couple other small battles, but mostly we organized raids on small towns where the gang would kill rape and steal, and burn down property of American patriots. One night, I was shot by the same man who nearly shot my brother in his head, Captain James Woods, as I was assaulting a girl in North Carolina. The bullet went right through my torso, and I was badly wounded. Yet, I felt no pain, nor did I fear death. My brother threw my limp body on the back of his horse, and we sped off into the darkness. 
as the bullets whiz through the air all around us. Big Heart was yelling, Don't you worry, little brother. You're gonna make it. Hang in there. You're gonna make it. Yet, in that same moment, my eyes were wide open. And I remember smiling and laughing uncontrollably as the blood ran down my face. I had never felt so alive. Now, I know it's hard for most folks to understand, but if I'm going to tell the truth, then I'm going to tell the entire truth. I love watching victims cower with fear as we had our way. I felt no remorse. Each time I violently ended someone's life, I grew stronger, more brazen, and my brother and I, we were unstoppable. Even the gang of murderers and thieves that ran with us, they feared us. You see, while they killed for necessity, we killed for pleasure. By 1781, we abandoned the gang that we'd been riding with and we joined up with the renegade band of Native Americans, the Chickamauga Cherokees. They, too, understood the hatred we had for the American patriots. These natives took us in like family, and we continued to fight and kill. By now, my brother, Big Harp, he had mastered hand-to-hand combat techniques, using the tomahawk as his only weapon from the Cherokees. Soon, his preferred method for killing was to split a man's skull wide open with his tomahawk, and we called it the tomahawk special. Me, my signature move was to slice a person's stomach wide open with my knife and fill the cavity with rocks. I called it the rock treatment. Plus, I had learned that doing this kept a body from floating if I disposed of it in a lake or river. In a strange twist of fate, we found ourselves in North Carolina again, where we ran into an old friend. Captain James Woods. We had the chance to kill him, but we decided to remain hidden and follow him home. After nightfall, we broke into his cabin and we stole his daughter and her friend. At first, both of the girls put up a good fight, but after a savage beating, they came around to seeing things our way. We set out with the girls and a few other men towards Chattanooga, Tennessee. One night, on our way, one of the men in our posse named Moses Doss, he had the nerve to tell Big Harp that he thought we were being abusive to the two girls. And for that, Big Harp gave him the tomahawk special and sank his tomahawk deep into the man's skull right between his eyes. He staggered around for a few seconds trying to speak before collapsing in a pool of blood. I've always said violence has a way of making folks come around to your way of thinking. And before long, my brother and I took the two girls with us, and we settled into East Tennessee at the conclusion of the Revolutionary War. During the next few years, we tried to make a go of it by settling down with the Cherokee tribes in Chattanooga. Big Harp had gotten both of the kidnapped girls pregnant, but he wasn't ready to become a father, so he disposed of both of the babies. But being the man that he was, he made it right and married both of the girls and made them his wives. Me, I was more of a one-woman man, so I married a preacher's daughter named Sarah Rice. Oh, we were one big happy family. By 1794, we were on the run again. This time, the Americans launched a massive attack on our Cherokee camp in Chattanooga, but we managed to escape on horseback to a place called Beaver Creek in the Powell Valley near Knoxville, Tennessee. I have to admit that up until now, it had been easy for my brother and I to get away with murder. It had all been chalked up to just being part of a bloody war for America's independence. At this point, we could have just easily blended into the pioneer lifestyle and never been heard from again. In fact, we did try. Once we were in Knoxville, we started farming hogs. And to supplement our farming operation, we occasionally would steal livestock from neighboring farmers 
Heck, we even burned down a couple farmers' barns to reduce competition. Yet, folks started noticing that each time we brought pork to the market, we would have more and more. You see, during this time, Knoxville was still a rough and rowdy frontier town and we seemed to fit right in until folks eventually got tired of us stealing. One night, we were at a saloon when a farmer named Johnson got into an argument with Big Harp about a horse we had stolen from him, and he stabbed my brother. We waited outside after the saloon closed for Johnson to come out, and we ambushed him and drug him into the woods where we slit his throat and gave him the rock treatment. Several days later, When they found his body floating in the Holston River, they formed a posse to arrest us. They chased us on horses before finally capturing us one night as we slept in the woods. They tied us up to bring us back to Knoxville for a public lynching. But Big Heart was so strong that he broke the ropes and we were free again. We quickly grabbed our wives and we knew we had to get out of Tennessee. For the first time, we were fugitives. We took the Great Wilderness Road through the Cumberland Gap towards Kentucky. We were desperate since we had little more than the clothes on our backs. And within the first day on the road, we came across a peddler selling tobacco. We needed his horse, so Big Harp gave him the tomahawk special. We took all he had and we rode off. The next day, we met two travelers from Maryland named Pekka and Bates. I noticed that the Bates man had a lot of coinage in his coat pocket so we convinced them that it was safer to travel in groups on this dangerous road. They agreed, and that night by the campfire, we shot them both. Bates died right away, but Pekka tried to escape after he was shot, so Big Harp gave him the tomahawk special. I split both their torsos open, and I filled them with rocks and tossed their bodies in the river. Since we had a little bit of money, we spent the next night at a boarding house called the Ferris Inn. Once we walked in, A stranger saw how rough and weathered we all looked, and that all three of our wives were visibly pregnant, and he offered to pay for our accommodations for the night. As a thank you, we offered the stranger to ride with us the next day, because there were lots of bad men out there, and he graciously accepted. When the authorities found his body filled with rocks just a couple days later, the innkeeper told the sheriff that we likely killed the man. Just a few days later, on Christmas Day in 1799, A posse arrested us, and we were taken to Stanford County Jail in Lincoln County, Kentucky. Hell, they put us all in jail. My brother, me, and our three pregnant wives. We spent the next 90 days locked up until Big Harp and me managed to escape on March 16th. The first order of business was to seek revenge on the posse that had captured us. So, we went home to the group leader, and we murdered his son. Once they found him filled with rocks, the Kentucky governor put a $300 bounty on each of our heads, wanted, dead or alive. All three of our wives gave birth while they were locked up in jail. Each of them were tried for murder, and they each testified how they were captives and forced to marry us. The jury agreed, and all three were acquitted. Many folks felt real sorry for them, and they gave them money and clothing and horses. They told them to travel back to Knoxville and start new lives. Yet, once the women were just a few miles from the courthouse, they traded their horses for canoes and they floated up the river to a spot we had all agreed to meet at. Just like that, our happy family was reunited and on the run again. We traveled by the Saline River towards Illinois. We were all piled into two small canoes, and we needed a bigger boat. Soon, we saw two fishermen named Edmonton and Stump. We killed them both and took their boat. The very next day, there were three men camping and cooking on the riverbank. They offered to feed all of us lunch, which we gladly accepted. I remember one of the men playing fiddle music for nearly two hours after lunch. Oh, it was good entertainment to be sure but we had to get a move on. Four days later, when the authorities found the three men, they were all victims of the rock treatment. Finally, we made it to Illinois, where we met a gang of river pilots led by the notorious Samuel Mason. They were living in a place called Cave in the Rock in southern Illinois. They took us in like family. You see, 
They made their living robbing slow-moving flat-bottom boats floating down the Ohio River. Now, for us, living in a cave was pretty boring for the most part. So Big Harp and I, we would take the victims that were captured by the pirates up to the top of a river cliff. We'd make them strip down, and then we'd push them to their deaths. The pirates, they were greatly disturbed by the way we killed people, and they made us leave the cave. Soon, the mountains of East Tennessee began calling our names again, so we headed back south. I'd like to tell you, we disappeared into obscurity, but I'd be lying. In July of 1799, on our way back through Kentucky and Tennessee, we killed a farmer named Bradbury. Then, another man named Hardin near Knoxville. This large area is now known as Hardin Valley. We murdered a coffee boy for his rifle in a place called Black Oak Ridge. A place now called Oak Ridge. A few days later, we gave a man named William Ballard the rock treatment. And now, folks all across Appalachia were looking for us. By late July, we were in Morgan County, Tennessee, when we came across two brothers, James and Robert Bransell, who approached us and asked us if we had seen the Hart brothers. I paused for a moment, and I said, You know, we just saw them just a little while ago over there in those woods. I'd be happy to show you where I saw them. And once we were all in the woods, Big Harp shot James, and I emptied my revolver shooting at his brother before he escaped. We took their horses and carried on. At the Tennessee-Kentucky border, we murdered a man named John Tully, then a man named John Graves and his son. Now that I think about it, I can't even tell you why we did it. We didn't see other people as humans, and we were void of any human emotion. We were killing machines. In 1799, we murdered an entire family of ten people. We stripped their bodies and hopelessly disfigured them. Big Harp killed a black boy by bashing his head into a tree. I stumbled upon a little girl picking wild berries, and I cut her leg off, and I kept each one of her toes as souvenirs. After that day, we were changed, and we began traveling through Kentucky as Methodist preachers. One lady named Mary invited us for supper and a night's sleep. She also gave shelter to another man named William Love, and that night, Mr. Love and Big Harp were trying to get some sleep, but Mr. Love's snoring was keeping him awake. So... Big Harp gave him the tomahawk special. The next morning, at breakfast, Mary's baby was crying, and Big Harp slit the baby's throat. When Mary screamed, she was also murdered, and then we burned her cabin down. If my memory serves me right, we killed three more men later on that day as we fled the scene. By now, posses had formed all over Kentucky and Tennessee to kill us. The saddest day of my life happened in Kentucky, when my brother, Big Harp, was shot in the streets of Muhlenberg County, and as he lied there dying, the posse began slowly cutting his head off while he was still alive. But, I have to say, he took it like a man. The last words Big Harp ever said, you're a goddamn rough butcher, but cut on and be damned. After they cut his head off, they put it on a stick right there in the middle of the street. That same moment, all of our wives were captured, arrested, and they stood trial in Russellville, Kentucky. Thankfully, justice was served and they were all acquitted. Me? Well, all the joy was now gone from my life. I traveled without purpose all the way down to Natchez, Mississippi, then all the way back to Cave and Rock in southern Illinois. You see, I found out that the pirate Samuel Mason had a $2,000 bounty on his head, so I killed him. I decapitated him, and I turned his head into the police. Yet, I never collected not one cent of that award. Since the police recognized me, and they threw me in jail, then, on a beautiful day in February of 1804, 
They put a rope around my neck, and he hung me from an old oak tree. As my body gently swung back and forth in the breeze, I could hear my brother saying, Hang in there, little brother. Yet, my eyes were wide open. I had a smile on my face, and I was laughing uncontrollably. I had never felt so alive.